Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from the CUNY TV Foundation, Capital One Bank, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, New York Community Bank, the Wickoff Group, m and Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, People's United Bank, RBS Citizens Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, LLC, and These Friends. So, you know, one day, you know, a kid who was born in Queens goes to Long Island, goes to Fordham, says, you know, maybe I'll become a physicist. Nah, I don't want to be a physicist. Then decides, you know, maybe I'm going to become a physician. Not a physician. Goes Stony Brook, Sinai, North Shore LIJ, and now is the founding dean of the Hofstra North Shore LIJ School of Medicine and the physician in chief of the North Shore LIJ Health System, Dr. Larry Smith. Thanks for coming today. My pleasure. So tell me about your great grandfather, who we're not certain where in Europe he came from, okay? But it's an interesting story because he was part of the Hebrew trade, right? Absolutely, yes. So my great grandfather on my father's side uh, immigrated from somewhere. We think on the eastern side of Europe Okay, somewhere. Okay, it could have been Poland or right. something like that. Uh, landed in Brooklyn, uh, had a, uh, a family, presumably in one of the Jewish communities in Brooklyn, and uh, produced my grandfather, right. who I can only suppose was a rebel. And, and your grandfather um, is a rebel and to the point that he meets this, uh, Irish, this Irish woman, right? That's right. Who immigrated from Ireland right. with your grandmother. And uh, they get married. They did indeed. A and what, what, what ha transpired, what you said to me, is both families said, we want to get rid of them, right? Absolutely. So, so they hadn't seen each other. It, it was true. The, the, the mixed marriage did not work going back many, many years ago. It really didn't. And, uh, you know, I know only from my father, because he was really the one who, who grew up almost uh, relativeless. Uh, you know, he, uh, on his father's side, he, he didn't see anyone uh, until I was actually in my teenage years. And uh, on his mother's side, her sister was close to her, but everybody else wasn't. So the true disownment of, yes. of, of the banishment, okay. Exactly. So, so tell me about your dad. Your dad was, uh, your, your grandfather, okay, uh, had an interesting situation that he was with when Dun & Bradstreet was truly the the, the purveyor of the of the credit system. Right. He he handled. He was in the apparel section of it, right? He was. Yes. He and, handled the garment district in New York. Right. And, and uh, you know, Grandpa Smith, you know, was literally the one to say, "This is we could approve him for credit, so you can manufacture the clothing." I suspect he was. Okay. So tell me about your dad. Where was your dad born? So my my father was born in Queens, 
and, uh, and grew up in Queens and went off to uh, World War II, returned and decided he wanted to be a civil engineer. And he, and he went to Manhattan College? He went to Manhattan College. And how did he meet your mother? Uh, at a dance for returning veterans. So I was born in Ozone Park and uh, lived there for four years. I don't really remember it. And we moved out to Long Island with the rest of the uh, young veteran families. Right. And you went to North Fork. North Park. North. Okay. You were saying to me that was a, that was a place that it was truly, it, it, it was like Levittown in, in a different manner. Because Correct. they were all returning veterans and they all were rather similar in age. Right. And uh, how did you your parents decide that they wanted to send you to parochial school? So I, it was kind of like a 50-50 split in our particular neighborhood, whether you went to the public school or to the uh, Catholic school. And uh, we all walked together. And the only question anyone ever asked was, your fa was your father in the Army, the Navy, or, uh, you know, the Marines? Uh, everybody was a returning veteran at the time. And all the kids were the same age or, you know, close, close in age. It was, it was the beginning of the baby boomer uh, generation. So w when you're growing up, did you have any idea that you, of, of, of medicine or health care? Other than my family doctor, no. Really, I didn't. So you, you graduate high school, mm -hmm. and you decide to go to Fordham. How, right. how did you decide to go to Fordham? Well, at the time, uh, my family really wanted me to stay close, and, uh, and that was fine with me. So, uh, so you went to Fordham in the, uh, in the Bronx, in the Bronx okay, right. on the Rose Hill campus. Studied physics uh, and mathematics, and I think for no better reason that it seemed like those were the subjects I was particularly good in in high school, so might as well go for it. Right. Now, you, you really wanted to be a physicist, you were saying to me. I did, or at least I thought I did. And then what happens? The epiphany happens? Well, so, being uh, perhaps the beginning of my introspective days, I, I looked and said, you know, I really like physics, but I don't think I'm that good at it. And uh, I knew I was good enough to work in the field, but I wasn't going to be someone who changed the field. And so I looked around and said, I need to find something where I can really feel like uh, I can be on the top of my game. Now, when, when did you go to Michigan State? So that's when I went to Michigan State. I, I had a lot of interest in uh, what was an, a new field at the time, which was applying traditional physics principles to biologic systems. And Michigan State had one of the first departments of biophysics. And I went out there as a graduate student. And uh, actually had a very exciting but brief time in graduate school. Uh, working in a lab that was discovering a major anti-cancer drug, really th as a spin-off of physics studies, not, not classic pharmacology. And uh, at the end of the year, it was an exciting year. The, the lab knew that they had just made a major breakthrough. Uh, I really, I said to my wife, you know, if this is as exciting as research gets, and I suspect it is, I think I need more human contact. Uh, How did you meet your wife? Because you were married at this time. I was. So I met my wife when I was at Fordham. We volunteered together. Volunteered in what area? We volunteered to do physical therapy on a disabled child. And so we, everyone in the neighborhood knew that uh, I was on one leg and she was on the other doing passive physical therapy and, uh, and we met. So now it's, it's the young couple living in Michigan. Right. Uh, saying, I don't want to be a physicist because it's not going to be an area that I want. How do you decide it was going to be medicine? Besides the fact that you were number 31 on your, uh, that you were ready to go to the Army because if you, on your. Correct, that's true. I, on I the lottery. About, I was about to be drafted at Fordham. Uh, and that's, right, but uh, that's why you went to That was one of the medicine. motivations for going, uh, to, Michigan. going to, to Michigan. Uh, but uh, at the time, I really, I got a lot more exposure to medicine and uh, because they were, because they had stumbled on this potential anti-cancer drug. And, and really felt that that was closer to my real satisfaction and skill set. But now you needed graduate courses because you needed courses because you didn't have enough courses. Well, you know, I had taken a lot of science courses between graduate school and, and being a math and physics major. Uh, and so I applied to a lot of medical schools, but I was never pre-med, so I was never nervous about the process. Uh, and uh, all but two promptly rejected my application. Right. And, and, the, and the first one you said to me who accepted your application was NYU, Correct. School of Medicine. 
and you needed a hundred dollars, right? There was a hundred dollar application. No, in no. no. So they accepted me. They actually accepted me uh, when I was down to only two people willing, two places willing to look at me. They accepted me, and they wanted a deposit, and I was very excited at this acceptance, and uh, I went home to our graduate student housing at Michigan State and said to my wife, we're in medical school, we're going back to New York, but they need $100. And we spent the rest of the night scraping together $100, sent it off in a check the next morning, and that very next day, the other medical school calls me. University of Michigan. University of Michigan offers me a spot, and I said, well, I spent my last dollars, you're a day too late. Sorry, but I'm going to back to New York. Now, you come back to New York, and, and you said to me, you and your wife found this apartment in Queens with this wonderful landlord, right? Yes. A and the, the landlord, every Christmas, would you give you the, the money back? Uh, For my December rent. For your December rent. They were worried that we were starving to death. You know, now, at this time, your, your wife was in nursing school? She was in nursing school. Right. So she's in nursing school, and you're at NYU. Right. And... Um, at NYU, um, how did you decide that you wanted to be an internist? You know, at the time, uh, and you have to look at, at the period of time, I honestly think that internal medicine was the most intellectually challenging field. It was the puzzle solvers, the diagnosticians. Uh, everybody wasn't subspecialized. Uh, and so there really were... Uh, people who walked around the hospital who literally were solving the problems, and they were the internal medicine doctors. Uh, and one of them was the, the dean, was was Saul Farber. Dr. Farber, yes, right. who had tremendous influence in my choice. Right, because Saul, you know, w was a, a great human being. He, he was there all the time. He came from Bellevue, and he was literally, he, he was a dean and president, but he was basically doc, Dr. Farber. He was. So you, you finish... Uh, your your uh, medical school, and then you do your residency. I did, yes. At NYU also. No, I, I actually went up to Rochester. Oh, that's right. Strong right. Memorial Hospital. Right. So you're in Rochester uh, for three years. Right. And then you have a. Then it's time. Hey, you know, you had the number thirty-one, but right. it was the deferment temporarily. They got me. So you, but you had a good opportunity. You, I did. You, you go out to uh, Denver, Colorado. I did. And you're working in what? A big medical center, Fitzsimmons Medical Center, which was one of the big Army medical centers. Um, and I had a great uh, opportunity to work there, to teach residents, uh, and had a, a, had a wonderful two years in Colorado. So it's, you know, look, so y you were in Michigan, you were in Colorado, and New York. And Rochester. How'd you this, and Rochester. And how did you make the decision to come back to New York? Absolutely family. So you come back. It was the pull of family. And what, what, what do you, you go into a large group, right? I went into a group practice out on Long Island. Uh, which subsequently was affiliated with North Shore. With, with, with Mount Sinai. With Mount Sinai yes. and North Shore. And what, what changes you to decide that you want to get involved with teaching, that you're going to involved with Stony Brook? <laughs> so I, from day one, I, I literally arrived at the practice and uh, drove out to Stony Brook and said, I'm here, I'm in Northport. Uh, I'm practicing in Huntington, and I'm willing to teach for nothing. I want to volunteer. And they immediately took me up on it. And then after about nine years, they called me up and said, wouldn't you like to come full-time and work for us? Uh, everybody likes your teaching, and uh, we need somebody to run our teaching program. And uh, I left practice and went full-time in the Department of Medicine there. So wh what, what brings you from... Uh you know, Stony Brook, nice provincial Long Island community, to uh, Fifth Avenue and 100th Street, to the Mount Sinai School of Medicine and Mount Sinai Hospital. So one of the most special people that I worked with at Stony Brook was a Dr. Barry Kohler. He was the chief of hematology at the time. And he got recruited to be the chairman of medicine at Mount Sinai. And uh, Barry convinced me to come there and be his vice chairman and uh, run the teaching program and... Uh, help him, the two of us, kind of work together on the clinical service there. So when do you join uh, Sinai? That was 1993. So it's 1993, healthcare in 93, it was, it was about to explode. The world was changing, okay? Right. There were, there were terminologies like HMO, you know, social capitation, different world, okay? 
you're you're at the medical school, right? And uh, let's talk about those thirteen years, uh, not thirteen, eleven years, I think. Twelve years. Yeah. Eleven, twelve years at the medical school. Tell me right. about what you did over there. So I started out doing much what I did at Stony Brook, only a, on a much larger scale at Mount Sinai, uh, being the vice chairman of medicine and running the residency and the medical student teaching programs, and uh, and practicing and seeing a lot of patients and. Uh, learning what a Manhattan hospital was all about and uh, in a major medical school. Uh, I was uh, reasonably successful. I, the residency program became very competitive and we got some great people. And uh, Barry always told me this was a nine-year commitment for him. Uh, you know, he was willing to sprint for nine years, but then he would move on. And sure enough, he did. And uh, when he left, uh, the dean asked me to become the senior associate dean essentially of medical education and moved to running the four-year curriculum of the medical school and so I moved from the Department of Medicine to the dean's office so you you really you were the dean I wasn't the dean I, but I was from the medical student standpoint I was the person day-to-day -day that they right. saw from the dean's office okay and then what happens you're happy over here. You're living in the city. You, you had moved to... I had moved uh, to the Upper West Side. Okay, you know, not too far. No, nope. No, that was on the East Side, but it wasn't... Life was uh, good. Uh, I walked through was, Central Park to go to work every day. So, so what happens, you know, that there's this institution, you know, uh, growing by leaps and bounds? Uh, at that time, probably, they have 16 hospitals now, but it was probably... Five eight, or six. Five yeah, or six. something like that. Uh, you know, and, and this was part of the health care changes, you know, because there was the merger of the North Shore uh, and the merger of the LIJ. And what happens? How do you get recruited over to North Shore? So I knew a lot of people from Long Island from my years practicing there, and I had a lot of friends even just from growing up. And uh, one of my very good friends came after me and said, please come and meet with the search committee. We're looking for somebody uh, to be the chief academic officer here. And uh, it's going to be a great job because we're growing, we're changing, we're going to redefine uh, health care on Long Island. And uh, I didn't know whether I really needed to go take a job redefining anything. I was really actually pretty comfortable. And I met with the search committee, and it was, a, it was a, clearly a good job, but I could have argued that it was a lateral, uh, lateral move from one place to another. Uh, also, he also he had a bigger commute now. Yes because my wife informed me she wasn't moving from the west side of Manhattan. Uh, and then I met Mike Dowling, who was the, is the CEO of uh, North Shore LIJ, and uh, realized that he was a special person. In True terms visionary. Of vision. Yes, and that, uh, that this could be a real opportunity to really do things that had not been done before. And uh, I think it was that intrigue plus a little bit of going home. I mean, I really grew up on Long Island. So tell me about you. What was business. your initial job before you got involved with the medical school, the creation? So for a very brief time, I was the chief academic officer. That was running their residencies, their affiliations with all the different medical schools that right, sent students they had, there. They had the Einstein, Einstein NYU, NYU and all this. Right. And then I became the chief medical officer, which was essentially the senior physician of the health system. And... Uh, I was responsible for quality and physician credentialing and managing uh, departmental initiatives and, and mostly the physician side of things. Uh, and I did that, again, quite happily, when all of a sudden, uh, you know, there was this kind of national plea to that build there was a new need, medical schools. Okay, there was a need for medical schools. And Correct. This is like 2006? Yeah, 2004, five, 5, 6. Right. And there's a plea that they need more medical schools. And how did Hofstra and Law Shore get together to create a medical school? So Stu Rabinowitz, the president of Hofstra, and Mike Dowling met. And really, uh, uh, Stu presented a, that he thought Hofstra was ready to host a medical school. It was a university. Right, good, it had a law school. Had a law that, school, a business, had a business school, school, good graduate programs. But that without a clinical partner, you can't build a medical school. And uh, I think Stu was right. He said, you know, we are the two uh, premier Nassau County uh, institutions. Uh, this is an area that can easily take another medical school. Uh, in fact, if you look, the number of students who were moving abroad to study medicine in order to come back, uh, 
the New York City and New York metropolitan right. area was number there one. There hadn't been a new medical school in like 40 years. Right. But there had been osteopath schools, but there hadn't been a school of medicine. Correct. And even few osteopathic right. schools. So really, we had really kind of just stagnated in terms of growth. So, so Mike and Stu agree. The board of trustees of both institutions agree. Right. But to, to become a medical school, you have to get accredited. Correct. So tell me about that. So they asked me to lead the initiative as the founding dean. Uh, and, of course, the, big, the first job is, what do you do as a founding dean? Uh, was that before, was that when Saul Katz told you becoming the founding yes. dean? Yes. So tell me the story, because I think it's a great story about that. Well, I, Mike had asked me to kind of bring the two sides together, find a good working relationship, uh, figure out what the relationship should be and the governance, and all the things that before you hire anybody, you really have to work out so that you don't get... Uh, you know, you don't have any political problems. And uh, we looked at a lot of models uh, of, of hospital uh, university relationships that manage medical schools, looked around the country, and I think came up with, with a nice solution of, you know, both institutions uh, feeling that they are owners of the medical school and, and really having a dual obligation, and similar to Montefiore and uh, Albert Einstein as a place close to home that has such a relationship. And uh, I worked things out, and I, you know, I, I, I drew out a governance plan. And, and then at the signing of this document, which basically brought the medical school into existence, uh, at the end of the signing, uh, Saul Katz, who was the chairman of the board of the health system at the time, uh, raised his glass for a toast, and it seemed like an appropriate time to have a toast. And everybody turns to me, and he says, now I want to toast the founding dean. Uh, and... Uh, since that was the first I had heard about that, uh, the first thing I realized is I should have negotiated the dean's role differently in the document had I known I was going to be the founding dean. But it was obviously a, a, a flattering request. <coughs> and uh, I took on the challenge. And the biggest challenge there was, number one, get a faculty together. You know, you need a team of people. And then number I mean, two... this is from the barrel. I mean, from... Nothing. The, right. There's nothing. There's no uh, entity. Correct. Uh, you know, get a faculty, a creative, aggressive, uh, forward-thinking faculty, uh, and then get accredited. I mean, you can't operate until you're accredited. And uh, How many years did that take? Three years. So the first class of, of the school starts in 2011, correct? Mm-hmm. Now, the, now uh, and you started, you, you, as you said to me, part of the class was that you wanted to make it affordable, for the first class because right. to start in, so the tuition was rather reasonable. Correct. Well, we felt that they were risk takers, and you know we had to, you know we had to make a contribution to acknowledging the risk that anybody's taking in a brand new medical school, and so for that class we actually have the tuition. And you you took in 20, 20 40. 40 in the first. We took year. forty in. Okay, and that was two thousand eleven. Then the next year. The second 60. year, 60, and then the third year, 80, 80. and then ultimately 100 will be our full class right. size. Now, what's interesting about the, the system, the, the, medical, the medical school, is one of the, it's very progressive, and, and I think people would be surprised about the, that one of the major things that these students do immediately is become EMTs. Correct. So tell me why. Well, we asked ourselves if one of the, most important roles of a medical school is to allow students to feel incrementally responsible for patients as their skill set grows. And that we wanted the students to learn science in the process of also learning about patients so that the science really stuck as uh, a meaningful solution to patient problems. We wanted to give them a skill set that would get them welcomed into the community, that, would, that they could have confidence in their, in their early skills and, and quickly learn from their patients and also be trusted with patient care uh, by the doctors in the clinical settings that they worked in. And we stumbled on the idea that maybe we should make them all EMTs. And that served other things. It, it taught them to work in teams because an ambulance crew is, you know, an extremely highly functioning team. It would let them see patients in the patient space, you know, their home, their community, not the doctor space of the office or the hospital. Uh, so it served a lot of purposes, uh, and we just we got permission from New York State to embed the EMT curriculum in the first two months of medical school. We got the health system to agree 
to open the ambulance corps to the students for their clinical activities. But as somebody said in one of the articles, you had no problem. You own the, the That's right. ambulances. It's always good to, to own, own the facility that you're asking to cooperate right. with you. Uh, but in fact, the emergency medical corps was extraordinarily excited about uh, welcoming the medical students onto the ambulances and have remained so. Right. Another interesting innovation of the program is that you don't have grades, right, in the first In the year? first two years we have, well, you can fail. I mean, it's, okay. you but can't otherwise fail. we don't discriminate the students because we ask them to, to really work in small groups collaboratively solving these case problems and teaching each other. So we don't want them to compete for grades. We want them to be happy to teach and the rest of their, their group and everybody succeeds together. Now what's also interesting is since you have your own 16 hospitals and nursing and, and skilled bed right. nursing homes and everything, these people see this, they're at, because they're EMTs, they're already in the institutions yes. during their first and second year. Absolutely. Which normally doesn't happen in medical school. Correct? Right, they're in both our physician's offices and of course you can't ride an ambulance and not be in an emergency room. So you know, even from day one, you're not just in the community or just in the ambulance, you're also arriving at the hospital and often staying with the patient. So what else, what other initiatives uh, and changes that uh, Hofstra North Shore has as opposed to the traditional medical school? Well, because we weren't burdened with any tradition, we, we took that as an advantage. I mean, it's nice to have tradition, but if you don't have tradition, you should, you should leverage it. And we organized the curriculum in the way that we felt was the most logical way you would teach people who know nothing about the human body, everything about the human body and health and disease, if you didn't have the problem of departments, where departments wanted discrete courses. And so we organized the curriculum completely not worrying about departmental ownership of curriculum and just asked the question, what would be the most logical way to roll this out if you didn't have to worry about departments? And uh, we had some incredibly creative scientists from our research institute that just really helped right, us. At the Feinstein. At the Feinstein. They just came up with a fantastic way to present the curriculum if you didn't have to worry about who owned what piece of the curriculum. So tell me about uh, the, the Smith children. You're married to, your wife's name is? Debbie. And you and Debbie have what, four? Four children. So tell me about the oldest one. So my oldest son, Chris is a physician. Uh, he palliative care. Palliative care and internal medicine. And he is very involved in health care reform. Uh, he really believes that uh, we need to change the way we take care of patients at a fundamental level. And uh, he's been part of a lot of demonstrations. And he's projects. married to who? He's married to Anne Marie, who's a neonatologist. And they have? They have four children. And their names? So. Uh, so I've got uh, Nora, who's nine, Gavin, who's six, and two twin girls who are 18 months. Okay. Uh, and the next? My son, Kevin, uh, MBA, uh, works for a uh, software company and uh, has one grandchild. Name? He's only four and a half months old. Okay. Quinn. Next one? Is Matthew is a structural engineer, lives in Charleston is uh, specializes in in ocean structures and uh, is a very successful and young the man. the baby? Is Patrick and Patrick lives on Long Island uh, is uh, just became a paramedic uh, that's following having gone to film school and uh, is uh, he's right now very involved in the technology around education but also likes uh, the patient contact uh, and I think he wants to kind of split his time so, so for, the, for the kid who wanted to be a physicist, uh, who has become the founding dean, um, uh, you've really had an interesting life, and thanks for being here today. Well, thank you for inviting me.